We are still in our series called Legit. Legit means the real deal, the truth. Legit, get real, break free. The Legit series, folks, if you haven't noticed yet, is all about the truth that Jesus teaches, His commandments, His principles. And we are told by none, none, uh, no less than Jesus Himself that He will set us free. When we know the truth and apply it in our lives, we will know He is indeed the way, the truth, and life, and He Himself will set us free. Set us free for what? Set us free to be the people that He has called us to be in the first place. Now, we just finished an amazing sub-series called Legit Happiness on the Beatitudes. Last week, Pastor Peter began us, so started us off on another sub-series called Legit Purpose. God has a legit purpose for your life and mine. And we were reminded last week about two of the worst things that could ever happen to your life and mine. The first worst thing is that we could live life without any meaningful purpose. And the second, probably even worst thing, is that we would live life thinking we have a purpose, but it's the wrong one to pursue. Living life for the wrong reason. That's an even greater tragedy than having no purpose, no meaningful purpose whatsoever. It reminds me about this very accomplished man. He, he was a surgeon, very wealthy, very well known all throughout the world. But one day he met a tragic accident and it was a horrible accident and he was injured all over his body. But the worst injury was in his hands. And remember, this man was a surgeon. And so as he contemplated his future on his hospital bed, he asked himself, do I still have a purpose in life? But eventually he discovered that there was a higher and better purpose for him. Now I think many of you know who this surgeon is. Marvel fans in the house, anyone? Doctor Strange, that's right, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm just throwing some light moments in an otherwise very critical uh, time that we have together. But seriously, folks, what would happen if God's people in the midst of all of, their, all of our daily activities, actually, if we were pursuing just one purpose, what would happen if ordinary people like you and like me were to truly embrace and live our lives according to God's purpose for us? You know, amazing things would happen because God uses ordinary people to achieve extraordinary things. Now, for the next two Sundays, today and next Sunday, first, today, we will look at what God has been doing all throughout the Philippines, all throughout the nation of the Philippines, using ordinary people to do His amazing, extraordinary, supernatural work. It's going to be a really exciting day, folks, as we see God unveil before our very eyes what He has been doing throughout the Philippines. Next Sunday, we will see what God has been doing through the local church all throughout the rest of the world, how He has been using ordinary people from CCF to touch and transform the lives of many others all throughout the globe. So folks, fasten your seat belts. It's going to be an amazing next couple of Sundays leading up to our anniversary on the third or the last Sunday of this month. But the reason why we are sharing all of this with you is not for us to say, wow, oh, how nice, but for all of us to be part of the movement. There are not to be any spectators in this room. All of us, as we embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are to be part of this movement. No bench warmers. Is that clear? Wow, okay, 17 people believe that's clear. Is that clear, folks? Yes. Absolutely, that's great. So, what is God's purpose? Or another word for purpose is what? Mission, right? So what is God's mission or purpose for us? Remember God's mission for CCF, to honor God and to make Christ committed followers who will make Christ committed followers. Do you remember what our mission is? Do you hear this often? Can you say it from memory? Very good. But the question is, are we living out this mission? This is a great purpose given to us by Jesus 2,000 years ago. Now, just as great as this mission is, it also requires a great strategy. And Jesus himself gave us that strategy 2,000 years ago. None of this was invented by CCF. Jesus is the author of all of this. That's why it's all about him. And so 2,000 years ago, this is what he said, Matthew 28. And shall we read this together, everyone? And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me 
in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, focusing on verse 19 through 20, do you remember what the main verb is? Okay, let's test. What is the main verb in this whole phrase or this whole command? How many of you say the main verb is go? Raise your hand. Okay, you believe the main verb is go. How many of you believe the main verb is baptize? I don't have super eyes like Pastor Peter, but trust me, he's looking all over the room. How many say the main verb is teach? How many say the main verb is make disciples? Hallelujah. We are 95% on target. There's nothing wrong with the other words, but that is the main verb, make disciples. Disciples. We make disciples as we go. In other words, in our everyday life, beginning with our homes and families, we make disciples. We talk to our, our families about Jesus and talk to the, our children about the Bible. That's why we have this little insert in the Chronicle. Do you have this in your Chronicle? So that we can help our families grow in, in the fear and knowledge of God. And so we go, we make disciples as we go in our offices, in our schools. We, we try to earn an excellent reputation for the glory of God so that eventually we can baptize people into, into the family of the, of the Lord and eventually teach them even more about how to grow in that relationship. So that's the whole idea. Now last week, you and I were introduced to a very specific way by which we are to be disciple makers. And last week, we heard again from Jesus' own words, he said, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Two amazing spot-on imageries that Jesus used. You and I are, are the salt of the earth, meaning to say we are to live lives as we represent Jesus on earth. We are to live lives that will help retard the decay of this world. We are meant to live lives that are supposed to create a thirst in other people for the Jesus that you and I know. And you and I are the light of the world. Now, maybe some of you still remember in movie theaters, there were ushers, right? And as you walk into a dark theater, they turn on their flashlight and they usher you to your seat so that you can enjoy the main feature. You and I are something like that. We are the light of the world. We, we shine the light of Jesus through our lives so that we can usher them into his presence and into a relationship with him. So is this mission is this role for us clear to everyone in this room salt and light i have another question is this a simple role to play in this world aha we are quiet is it simple well the answer is yes and no yes in the sense that we can comprehend what this means but no in the sense that not only is this role difficult to play it is actually impossible. Do you realize that? On our own power, you and I could never be the salt and light that God calls us to be. And so our main text for today is this, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Shall we again read this all together? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Two key words for us today, power and witness. We cannot be his witness without his power. And so our message today is very simple. Our legit purpose, by his power, be his witness. I didn't want to leave out the first line, because without the first line, we could never be the second line. There is no effective witnessing without the power of God's Spirit behind us, within us. So let's break down this verse a little bit more. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit is come, has come upon you. This, he is what we receive and power through him, the Holy Spirit. That is the power that God has allotted for you and for me. And this should be a comfort for us, knowing that as we go and live lives that the Lord wants us to live. It's not by our own power that we will do so. And we should never make that mistake relying on just our own strength. His unlimited, amazing power is for us to use to, our, to His advantage and for His glory. 
And then there is the, uh, the purpose, who we are to be. You shall be my witnesses. Notice that even when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world, he didn't speak about what we are to do. He first spoke about who we are to be because being is more important than doing. And doing is just an outflow or overflow of who we are in Christ. And so we are to be his witnesses. That is his purpose for us. No exceptions. And finally, the plan, where we are to witness, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of God's people will be called to far-flung places to, pre to speak and share the gospel and make disciples. Some of us may, but the important thing is this. Wherever we are right now, are you somewhere right now? Of course you are. Every day of the week, you're somewhere. There are people around you. There we are to be his witness. Are we clear so far? By his power, be his witness. So let's go one by one in each of these components. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This word power is an amazing word. The original word is dunamis. And dunamis, that's where eventually some English words come from. The English word dynamite, the English word dynamo, the English word dynamic. You get the sense that there is a power behind all of these, uh, these words. But specifically, dunamis means the power to achieve something or to accomplish a task. Specifically, it's associated with the Holy Spirit as, we, as the word is used throughout Scripture. Associated with the Holy Spirit, it is supernatural power to accomplish the role given us by Jesus. That is the specific and contextual meaning of this word. And like I said earlier, this should comfort you and comfort me because it means that regardless of our background, regardless of our educational attainment, regardless of some mistakes we've made in the past, regardless of our age or even our physical challenges, Jesus says, you are or you will be my witnesses. That's why there can be no bench warmers because Jesus made no exception. He said, all of, these, all of my people, all of my followers will be my witnesses. It reminds me of this um, particular story. This uh, couple in the U.S., they were snowed in because of, and, and the power was out because of a severe winter storm. And so one Sunday morning, they were huddled together and they were listening to a transistor radio, just like us when there's a typhoon, right, and the power is out. All you have to do is just, left to do is listen to a transistor radio and get the updates on what's happening in the outside world. So they were listening to this transistor radio. And as they heard the news updates, they heard something that struck them. And the message they heard was this. The following churches will be closed due to lack of power. And that made them think. And it should make us think as well. Because if CCF will ever make the mistake of relying on what some people call its brand or its momentum or its connections, then we may as well just shut down because it will be a severe and fatal mistake to rely on our own power. God says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You and I are called to be church, a church of power. That's why the Spirit-filled life is so important. The Spirit-filled life is meant to be the normal, everyday life of a follower of Jesus. Are we good so far? Hey. It reminds me of some of the other verses that use this same word. You know, when we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, amazing things happen. The Apostle Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When you and I know that God's power is working within us, we don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. I know one guy from CCF just recently. He was in a jeepney. And in that jeepney, you know, with other people, there was this woman who was struggling. She had a lot of stuff with her, and then she had a little baby, and then she was trying to change the, what do you call the cloth on the back of the baby? 
Bimpo or something like that. Is that right? Anyway, so she was trying to change it, and she couldn't do it. And so our, our member said, can I help you? And of course, the, the lady was just too happy to, help, to allow him to help. And so he helped. And then other people in the jeepney began to help. And then he started a conversation, and other people joined in. And before you know it, he's sharing the gospel, and everybody in the jeepney is listening to the gospel. And before you know it, he's inviting the whole jeepney to the anniversary service two Sundays from now. Why is that? Because we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. Because it's not our power that wins people to Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit's power. The same person who wrote this verse, the Apostle Paul, wrote this. By the way, before we read this, honestly, are there times when you are afraid to share the gospel? Are there times when you feel inadequate to begin discipling even one person? Do you get like butterflies in your stomach and does your throat and mouth go dry? Well, welcome to the club. You're in good company. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said about himself. He said in 1 Corinthians 2, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now listen to verse 3. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Are we talking about the same guy? The Apostle Paul, the great man of God, the greatest evangelist and disciple maker in the New Testament next to Jesus himself. But look at what more he said. He didn't allow these things to hold him back. That's the important thing. He took the step of faith God wanted him to take. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men but on the power of God. There's a lady who comes to CCF Maine. She's over 70 years old. She has all kinds of physical challenges. She walks with a cane. She has very little resources, sometimes not enough even for transportation. But she told, she told God, I want to be used by you. And so right now, she's leading her own small group. And she even volunteers to visit sick people in the hospital so that she can share the gospel with them. So my question to all of us today is, can God use you? Good morning, everyone. Can God use you? Yes, He can, and He desires to do that, and it is our privilege to be used by God. So that's about the power from the Holy Spirit. Let's now talk about the purpose. And you shall be my what? my witnesses. Now, there are a couple of things required as far as witnesses are concerned. First, a witness needs to have personal knowledge or must have actually seen what he is testifying about. Does that make sense? Yes. The second requirement of a witness, now listen to this, is that he must say, he must share what he knows. He cannot just know he has to share what he knows. Otherwise, he will be held in contempt. Now, there is one thing that is not required of a witness, not required of him. One thing not required of a witness is to know everything, every single thing about what he has witnessed. For example, if he says, at 3.30 in the morning on my way home from work, I work in a call center, I saw an explosion take place at the opening of uh, the blankety blank mall. Now, they have no business asking him, was it a C3 explosive? Was it an improvised explosive device? He doesn't know any of that. The important thing is he says what he knows. At 3.30 in the morning, I saw the explosion go off precisely at this spot. And you know, it reminds us of this man in the Gospel of John. Remember the blind man? When he was taken to task by the Jewish religious leaders and they were pressing him, about Jesus. This is how part of that conversation went. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. They were trying to pin down Jesus using this guy. Now how did he answer? This is what he said. He then answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know. What did he say, everybody? that though I was blind, now I see. 
Now, anybody in this room, did you used to be spiritually blind, but now you see? If that's true for you, will you raise your hand with me, please? Oh, we have so many witnesses in this room. Am I right? Many years ago, when I had just given my life to Jesus, I didn't know much about the Bible. I didn't know much about, you know, there was no GLC back then, praise God for GLC today. But it was just the Bible and the Holy Spirit and the time I spent with God. Now, one time, I ran into my old classmate, my best friend from high school. And he actually became my first disciple. And many, many years later, just to show you how God can use ordinary people like me, many years later, this guy told my wife, you know what? Your husband and I, when we were together in high school, he was talking about me to my wife. He said, your husband and I, we were best friends in high school. But before I met your husband, listen, huh? before I met your husband, I was a good young man. <laughs> you understand what he's saying? Before I met your husband, I was a good young man. He corrupted my life. That was, you know, that's just what I did for this guy. In spite of that, he was still my best friend. But you know, decades later, this man saw something in me. When I talked to him about Jesus, about the Bible, he realized that I used to be blind, but now I could see. And now he's been, sir, he's been here with CCR for the last 20-something years, also leading small group ministering. <sighs> Folks, look at this picture. Just in April this year, the New York Times reported that a mail carrier, a postman, cartero, a mail carrier in Brooklyn, he started hiding away in a series on a, over a span of one year, he started hiding away pieces of undelivered mail. Now, what was his purpose? As a postman, what's his purpose? Deliver mail, right? Deliver packages. Somebody needs to read these letters. Somebody needs to receive these packages. But over a period of, of about a year, he was not fulfilling his purpose. He was just stashing it away. And when he was apprehended, and when he was asked, why did you do this? He says, well, it's just overwhelming. It's too much work. Folks, you and I have a message to deliver, right? Somebody needs to receive that message. Somebody who so badly needs it. One day in the past, somebody delivered that message to you and to me. He took the time. He had the compassion of Jesus in his heart. And because of that, because God used him, we are here today. Are we going to be like that postman and just stash those messages away and not deliver them? Or will we live according to our purpose? And we shouldn't look at it as work. We shouldn't look at it as something overwhelming, although it may feel that way. But God said, I will give you power to be my witness. Let me tell you how we should change our mindset about this whole idea of sharing the gospel and making disciples. Okay, look at this picture. This is only uh, symbolic, okay? Let me tell you this story. How we should change our mindset about sharing the gospel and making disciples. It should not be a chore. It is a mission, but it is also a privilege. Now, my wife will, and I will have been married 34 years by this December. But when we decided to get married over three decades ago, I did not give her an engagement ring. I could not afford it. Okay, so I did. Are some of you going? <laughs> Folks, forgive me. This is before Christ, okay? So I did not give her an engagement ring. Now, in the last year or so, before our 33rd anniversary last December, somehow she was recalling the past. She was not complaining. But since, you know, I officiate a, a number of weddings, you would hear about engagement and engagement ring and this thing. And she was kind of reminiscing about the fact that I did not give her one back then. So, last December, round about our 33rd anniversary, what did I do? Secretly, I went out and I bought an engagement ring because it's never too late. Wait, 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 save it. There's more. So I go out and, and buy an engagement ring. Now, secret, it's only a fraction of what most engagement rings cost, okay? But never mind. So 
And then during the staff Christmas party of CCF, in front of all of the staff, I go to the front, I get down on one knee, and I give her the ring. Oh, diba? Now you can clap. But here's my point. Now, my wife is very careful. She wears that ring every day, every single day now. But my wife is very careful. She, she doesn't want to boast about, oh, look, you know. But, but, when she's talking to somebody and the light hits the, gusto ko sana sabihin diamond, ano? When the light hits the thing, and then there's a sparkle, and then there's a sparkle, and somebody says, oh, what a nice ring. Ayan na. You can, you can, you know, be sure she will tell the story. Folks, you and I are the light of the world. And when people see that light, as we live excellent lives for Jesus on earth, when people see that light, it will give you and me an opportunity to tell that wonderful story of Jesus. That's why we are the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And by the power of His Spirit, we will be His what? Witnesses. I love what David Platt said. This is what he said about making disciples. David Platt is a pastor, author, and speaker. Now listen to what he said. I, I really believe we should take this to heart. Ultimately, why do disciples of Jesus make disciples of Jesus? Certainly, the answer is not because we are forced to, nor is it because we are guilted into doing so. The clear and simple motivation is a disciple's passionate longing to see more and more people know Jesus. For when our thirst has been eternally quenched by the infinite goodness, greatness, grace, mercy, majesty, strength, and sufficiency of God in Christ, we will excitedly and eagerly tell all who are thirsty where they can be satisfied. Making disciples of Jesus is the overflow of our delight in being disciples of Jesus. Being precedes doing all the time. What is our message today? Remember, by His power, be His witness. Let's go to the last point, the plan. Jesus said, in, all, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Again, I say, it doesn't mean that all Christians are meant to go all over the globe. Some may be. You pray about it. But here's the, the sure thing. Wherever we are right now, our Jerusalem, and later on we will hear more about what God is doing in, as it were, Judea and Samaria. But wherever you are right now, you and I are to be His witness. Salt and light by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what's one clear way you and I should do that. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. As we live excellent lives for Jesus and gain the trust and respect of people, they see that sparkle, they see that light, and it gives us the excellent opportunity to talk about our Savior. A couple of examples. One of our pastors uh, was a senior executive in a major corporation here in the Philippines. His reputation was so excellent that even after he had left full-time work from that corporation to serve in CCF, even up to now, the doors are wide open for him to teach Bible studies in that company. Even as we speak, he's starting a new one. Another one of our staff left his uh, IT company to join CCF, but his reputation there, his testimony was so excellent that, again, the doors were wide open for him to go back and spend a few hours each week to start a small group. Whatever we do, do it all for the glory of God. Young people, those of you who raised your hands when I said, how many of you are less than 34, but specifically young men and women in their teens. You know, there are so many young CCFers who through their own testimony have won their families to Jesus. Why? One is they pray for their family members. They pray constantly. Two is they share the gospel with their family members. 
But the third and very important one is their testimony. They become obedient to their parents. They become good sisters or brothers. They study hard. And you know, they don't have like their own little world. When their parents tell them, let's have dinner, they come down. They don't have to knock on the door and say, is there somebody still alive in this room? Just like one young lady, she came to know Jesus. And then later her parents, she was the only follower of Jesus in her family. And later on the parents said, you know, this boyfriend that you have, we don't exactly agree with him, that you should have him as your boyfriend. And you know, they got the shock of their lives. Their young daughter broke off the relationship. No questions asked. And so the parents, like their jaw dropped, what in the world is happening with our daughter? She's a totally new person. And eventually she invites the family to CCF. And long story short, now the whole family is following Jesus. That's what it means. Salt, light, by the power of God's Spirit, be His witnesses. Folks, all of this boils down to the importance of what we call the local church. The importance of the local church. Why is the local church so important? I'll give you just a few reasons. Why, you know, when God's people, ordinary people do amazing things through His power, it all boils down to the role of the local church. Three reasons why it's important. Number one, it is the spiritual family that God puts here on earth. People grow in their relationships with Jesus and with one another. It's also a place where people come and come to know Jesus for the first time. It happens a lot right here in this place. But it's also a salt shaker. It's not meant to hold the salt within. It's meant, that's why it's called a shaker. It's meant to shake the salt and spread it all over the world that's decaying and needs to know Jesus. But the, but the local church is also a serious choice to make. You need to choose the local church to which you belong very, very carefully. But it's just as important practically as choosing your spouse. Because whether it's the right decision or the wrong decision, it will impact the rest of your life. So folks, what's the message today? By His power, be His witness. And to let us know more about what God is doing, His amazing work throughout the nation in the local church, please welcome the chairman for the National Church Planting Movement in CCF, Pastor Ned Gotswiko. Let's welcome him. Dr. I'm Pastor Ned. I'm the, currently the head of the National Church Planting Movement of CCF. Now, one of the things that we've been learning is that there is what you call legit purpose. And every single one of us has been called by God and has been trained by God, whether we know it or not, or we're familiar with it or not, but all our experiences in the past is simply God's training ground so that we may be able to perform the, the, the purposes that He has for us. Another thing that we have to remember is when you talk about legit faith, it is a faith that transforms. A true experience with Jesus is an experience that brings about life transformation. Now, my friends, let me, all of us, each one of us, we all have our own stories to tell. And each one of us, our stories are quite unique in its own way. I'd like to share with you the three crossroad experiences that I've had in my life. You see, all of us in our lifetime, whether early in, early in our life or late in our life, we have people, we experience certain people who impacts our life so much, so significantly, that it drastically changes the trajectory of our life. Have you ever had that kind of person? A person who has such a great impact on you that it changes the course of your life. I stand here before you this morning not because of my competence, not because of who I am, but because of three people, three crossroad experiences that I went through, through these people that significantly changed the traje trajectory of my life. The first person who significantly impacted my life and changed totally the direction that I was to go was my father. You see, my father and I didn't have a good relationship. He never really liked me. 
In fact, he did not only not like me, I believe it bordered on hatred. My father hated me. Why do I say that my father hated me? Because when I was growing up, and these are vivid memories of what he has done to me, when I was about five years old, for the first time he called me, brought me to the market with him, and then left me there. He left me. But you know, with the hope probably that I won't be able to go back home anymore and that he would finally get rid of me. But here's the thing. I have the attitude of a cat. I was able to go home. Okay? And when I got home, I found my dad reading the newspaper. He looks up from his newspaper with a surprised look on his face and asks me, the most profound question that I will ever, that was ever asked of me. Paano ka nakauwi? Paano ka nakauwi? And my mom, passive as she was, was simply looking at me. Now, my, the reason why my father hated me so much was because the, on the year that I was born, his businesses fell. They all failed, one for one reason or another. And he was blaming me for the reversal of fortune from him being a wealthy, arrogant businessman into becoming an impoverished, arrogant alcoholic. But there's one thing that's very astonishing about my dad. He is a very religious person. And I, rem I remember early on from those ages, five, growing up, he would take us every Sunday. He would wake us up every Sunday, me and my brother and my mom. And we would go to church every Sunday. And he would confess every Sunday. And he would stand in line to take his communion every Sunday. And when we get home, or he would even talk to the priest and greet them and, and make money to them. But whenever we get home, he would have his bout with his cuatro cantos, his Cinebra San Miguel, he would finish that whole bottle, he would call me into his room, put me into a sack, and make me his punching bag. And this crossroad experience, when I was about seven, I was about eight, as I was observing my father, and I saw the disconnect between who he was in front of his God and who he was at home didn't just match up. And I started to question and started to ask, as I keep looking at him, this question. How can a God who says that they lo he loves me will allow my father to hurt me every single day that he would get drunk. And I was thinking to myself, I said to myself, I don't want to worship a weak God because that God cannot protect me. And in that crossroad, I finally decided, since I don't want to worship a weak God, I will believe that God does not exist. And so started my life, hardening my heart and developing my own accomplishment. And let me share with you the accomplishments that I had when I was young. I was recruited to be a runner by the Kabataang Makabayan when I was 10, becoming a legitimate gun-carrying member of KM when I was 12. I was a student agitator at the age of 14, and at the age of 17, I was instrumental in organizing the biggest student walkout and boycott in our city, involving seven universities with almost 15,000 students for 15 days. I was a troublemaker. I was into pornography at the age of 10. By 11, I was drinking and smoking. I knew all the gambling dens in our, in, our, in our city. And I would steal 
to be able to feed my vices. I was into drugs at the age of 13, and there's nothing that anyone can stop. And my motto in life was simple. My motto in life is this. People should be used and manipulated for my own personal agenda. I am not to fall in love with anyone because it is a weakness I cannot afford. And trusting people is only for the stupid, the coward, and the weak. I lived a life that was so separate from God because I didn't want to have anything to do with the God of my father. I didn't want to have anything to do with the God who cannot protect me as a child. But as li living, this, living this life made me so empty, so angry, and my violence would just come up and I would be so enraged by the simplest things because of the emptiness that I had. I looked for my significance not from something that I would, others would do for me, but rather I looked for the significance by hurting people because I knew that when people beg and ask mercy from me, then I have the power over those people. That was the first crossroad in my life. That was the first time, and that was my father. The second crossroad experience that I had in my life happened in 1992. I was working in, uh, I was working in Rio Tuba Nickel, Nickel Mines. It's a mining company in Palawan. I had with me my wife and my daughter, who was about one and a half years old, and my daughter contracted malaria. Malaria was so severe, she was peeing blood, and she was having black water fever. And the doctor, the company doctor, told us that she had to be airlifted to Manila just for her to be safe. But we had no way of airlifting her. That was the lowest point of my life. The feeling that I would lose a precious child, somebody that I love. That is also the point of my second crossroad experience. A pastor, the father of my, my wife's office mate, came to the house, encouraged us, talked to us. Now remember, I was still an atheist at that time. And But I was so down that when he asked me the question, after sharing all of these things, I was crying with him. When he asked me the question, would you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? My simple reply was this. If your Jesus can save my daughter, I will accept him. And so he goes on and tells me, so will you pray with me to accept him? And I said, if your Jesus can save my daughter, I will pray with you. And I prayed with him. We prayed the prayer of salvation. And two things happened that very night. I felt a peace that I have never experienced in the past. I felt the anger leaving me. I felt as if somebody was just embracing me. It was a calm that has eluded me all those years. And I began to experience the love of Jesus. All because one man whom I never knew until that time took the initiative to come to the house to share the gospel with me. The second miracle that night was with my daughter. Later that evening, she vomited. She had fever. She, she started to vomit something that is dark and gooey phlegm. And for the first time in two weeks, she literally slept like a baby. No fever, no disturbance. And the following day, she was outside the house playing. No fever, no sign of malaria, and no nothing in her body. My friends, that was my turning point. That was my greatest U-turn. And the reason why I had that U-turn was because somebody took the time, initiated to come to the house to share the gospel with me. 
That is where my passion is coming from. I am so passionate for planting churches because I believe that out there, based on my experience, there are so many thousands, millions of net butchicos, empty lives, rage coming out, manipulating people, finding their significance in things that does not, not, not really matter, and yet in their emptiness, not knowing where or whom to turn to. Church planting is bringing the church, the body of Christ, where the people are. You see, God met me where I was at the time, not knowing Him. God did not expect me to come to Him in prayer. God took the initiative through a person to meet me where I was. There are millions of people out there just like me at the time. And it is time for us as the body of Christ, as the family of Jesus, to meet them where they are. It is our duty, it is our obligation, I would say our obligation, to bring the body of Christ where they are. That, my friend, is why the National Church Planting Movement exists. We want every single person where we go to experience the love of Jesus, to meet them at their point of need, and for them to understand who Jesus is in their lives. I experienced it. I love my God. I love Jesus because He exists. CSF Vision says it is to see a movement of millions of, fol of, of followers of Jesus, Christ, of Jesus meeting in small groups, transforming lives, families, communities, and nations. And through church planting, we are focusing and helping them transform, bring us into the vision of transforming communities and the nations, all for the glory of God. CCF has what you call a Vision 2020. What exactly is Vision 2020? Let's all watch this video. God, wonderful. You know, our vision is to bring the church, the body of Christ, to 100 cities by the year 2020. And this year, we are going to open 10 new satellites. We are going to open 10 new satellites. Let's give God a clap offering. Okay. Now, here's what I'd like to ask of you. If you have friends or relatives living in these cities, you can excitedly inform them that we are going to start a CCF satellite in their cities. We want to bring Christ closer to the Lord. Uh, we want to bring people closer to God by going where they are. Now I mentioned that there are three people who significantly impacted my life. Let me share with you my third story. When we got back to Manila, late uh, late 90s, I, but I started at, we started to attend CCF. This is our first real home church coming from a traditional belief. Okay? And I was so longing to become part of a small group, a small group. That's what they call it at the time. And so I, at the time, I was the director for human resource of a uh, multinational hotel chain. 
And I wanted, I said, I filled out the form. I said, I wanted to be part of a cell group belonging to the same people as I was. So I, want, I said, I wanted a group that is uh, English-speaking. I wanted a group that is uh, uh, made up of vice presidents, executives, so we can, I can relate to them. And God gave me the perfect discipler. He gave me the perfect discipler. He sent me a second-year high school dropout driver of CCF. I'm not kidding. My first discipler was so diametrically opposite of who I was. At first, I really didn't understand it. I said, Lord, I was asking for somebody else, but you sent me this guy. But this person, at that juncture in my life, moved me in another direction once again. You see, our lives are totally different. Our backgrounds were totally different. Okay? He was a second-year high school dropout. I have an MBA. He is the driver of CCF. I was the HR director of a multinational hotel chain. He rides a tricycle. I ride a wonderful car. He speaks Tagalog. I like English. Okay? But there is one thing that allowed me to see why God sent him to me. He loved the Lord so much. And I was seeking to know the Lord deeper. It was a relationship that I feel was good, designed by our Lord. And here's what I learned. God will use anyone at any level, by any means, to impact our lives. God is not a respecter of person, of position, of status, of wealth. But rather, he is a person. He is a God who looks at the hearts of men. God is not interested in my performance or your performance, your competency or my competency. God is interested in our faithfulness and intimacy with him. So that in our faithfulness, he can perform through us and thereby glorify himself. This man opened my eyes on what true discipleship is all about. It was not about having common interests. It was not about being with people of the same stature as I was. It was all about a life impacting another life, helping that person in their spiritual journey and growth. And I will not stand before you today apart from that man. You see, my friends, these three people, if we look at it, gave me a total U-turn. When I accepted Jesus, my Lord and Savior, I prayed with all my heart that my father will not be saved. I prayed. Simply lang prayer ko doon. During the first three months that I was a Christian, my prayer was this. Probably prayer nyo rin to. Okay, just listen. This is my prayer. And if this is your prayer, you better repent about it. Okay? My prayer was, Lord, you have accepted me. You have made me your child. I know that I will go to heaven. I will know that I will go to your kingdom. Please, Lord, do not send anyone to share the gospel with my dad. As you have accepted me in heaven, I pray that you send him to hell. And I justified this. Inexplain ko sa Panginoon kung bakit. As if he didn't know. Sabi ko, Lord, just think. I die, I go to heaven. Somebody shares the gospel with my dad. He goes to heaven. I live in my own mansion. He lives in his own mansion. Probably will be in the same street, three houses away from me. 
I would get out of my house, walk in your streets of gold. He would leave his house, walk in the streets of gold. And we meet on the road, and we will argue, and we will fight, and it will embarrass you. So, Lord, to avoid any embarrassment, ako na lang, send him to hell. But guess what? I mentioned to you how God turned my life around. God had a wonderful sense of humor. One month before my father died, I shared the gospel with him. I asked for his forgiveness. I initiated because I knew that God loves him as much as he loves me. And I remember telling him, sitting with him on the, uh, uh, in the kitchen table, I told him, Dad, I'm so sorry for not respecting you. I'm so sorry that for the past 30 years, I have drawn hatred against you when in fact you are the father that God sent to me. And my dad looked at me and said, Net, I'm so sorry for all the pain that I have caused you. That has been battled in my heart. Alam mo, MMK, iyakan kami pareho. Okay? And we hugged one another. I led him through the prayer, sinner's prayer. And one month later, he died. My friends, there are two things that's so important to me. One is to plant churches. And the second is the realization that if somebody ha- would have shared the gospel with me when I was young, if somebody cared enough for me when I was young and shared the gospel with me, if somebody during those moments that I was in pain, and that I was questioning God. Somebody came and shared the gospel with me. I wouldn't have wasted all those years hurting people. I would have lived a more productive life. And so my second passion, my friends, is for the youth, the next generation. You see, the pain that I went through as a child, as a youth, when I turned away from the Lord, their lives, the young people right now, their lives are more complicated than it was in my time. The need for God is deeper now. The need for self-esteem is greater. And our children are looking for their significance in their gadgets. They are looking for their significance in social media. And this is where we, my brothers and sisters, this is where we should intervene. We have to support. My passion is to support our youth movement. We have Elevate. And through Elevate, we have leaders, young men and women, who was so devoted in leading and guiding their age, same age as they are. But these kids, they need us. They need kuyas and ates. They need people who can guide them. My friends, right now, Elevate is in 262 campuses. They are now in 262 campuses, colleges, and high schools. And another component of Elevate is what we call the Rescue Kabataan Elevate. The Rescue Kabataan Elevate is a non-profit CCF organization that deals with the primarily wants to reach out both high school and colleges. It is to rescue children, rescue the youth from their darkest moment, bring them into a discipleship relationship, and in the end, as they are being discipled, become disciplers as well. It is impacting the school. It is touching the lives of people. It is addressing 
the most common vices that exist in schools right now. Drug abuse, sexual immorality, internet addiction, pornography, depression, alcoholism, and suicide. You see, my friends, people, our kids, are so much into this that their, dark, their lives have been darkened. They need us. We need, they need us to help them out. If they were, if I went through those difficulties, if I went through those accomplishments when I was young, can you just imagine the kids, what they are going through right now? The vision of the vision of uh, Rescue Kabataan is to see a movement of millions of followers of the Lord Jesus, Jesus meeting small groups and transforming lives, families, communities, nations, all for the glory of God. Now, let me just share with you why, why Rescue Kabataan is so wonderful. Rescue Kabataan is actually recognized and has a partnership with the National Youth Commission, with the Department of Education, with the National Movement of Young Legislators, and it has become an anchor program of SK. The Rescue Kabataan program is intended to reach out to the youth. And we have been given access through DepEd to all 18,000 schools, public schools in the entire Philippines. That is how wonderful this program is. We have signed agreements with the government sector. We've started to do, we've done trainings for, for CCF volunteers. You see, it's a, it's a, it's a CCF church-based program. We are currently running 29 in 29 schools. And we're hoping, by God's grace, that this year, this year alone, 2018, we will be able to have at least 500 small groups, Barcada Care Group, that's what they call it, Barcada Care Group, that will touch the lives of about 5,000 people, 5,000 kids. And eventually, our prayer is that we will be able to reach all the 72 schools that we have targeted this year to be able to reach out to them and come up with at least 1,000 small groups. My friends, I stand in front of you because somebody initiated and became a witness to me. Each one of you here are seated with me or are here because someone initiated to share the gospel with each one of you. Somebody loved you enough to share with you the wonderful message of Jesus. My question is this. If somebody cared enough for you, shouldn't we care enough for others as well? Shouldn't we take the gospel of salvation to our friends as well? That every single seat that is vacant here is specifically reserved for your family members who doesn't know the Lord yet. Rescue Kabataan, the youth, is a future, our future. It really works. It impacts people, not only the students, but the entire community as well. Let's watch this video. Pagtungtong ko po ng mismong grade 6, doon po namulat sa akin yung pornography. Nung pagtungtong ko po ng junior high, doon po mas natrigger din po sa akin yung pagkalito ko po in terms of my sexuality. Naging bisexual po ako. Um, ako yung tipong babae na sumasama sa mga tropa na bad influence. Um, Na-influence siya hindi na ako na ma manood ng porn. Nagka-boyfriend din ako at age of 16. May mga ginagawa kami na hindi pa dapat gawin ng isang kagaya namin. Doon ko nahanap sa boyfriend ko na yung pagmamahal, yung pag-aalaga kasi hindi ko siya naramdaman sa papa ko. Yung pinasok po ng school namin ng 
rescue kabataan eh. Nakilala ko po yung sigad because of Ate Abigail Mesa, yung testimony niya pa. Grade 9 po ako, meron pong pumunta na rescue kabataan. Doon ko po na nalaman po yung testimony ni Ate Abby, so nakaka-relate po ako kasi po um, ang bata-bata niya pa lang po is nawala na siya ng tatay. Tapos parang naisip ko, ako may tatay ako pero parang hindi ko nararamdaman yung presensya niya. Yung rescue kabataan na yon is ilo-launch dito sa school namin. Ako yung mamamahala dun sa programang yon. Feeling ko isa siyang pabigat na trabaho. Talagang stressful sa akin yung rescue kabataan. Nagulat po ako sa sinabi ng boyfriend ko na gusto niyo muna daw po kami mag-serve sa Lord. Narealize niya na marami na daw po kami nagagawang hindi maganda, hindi nakaka pleasant kay Lord. So, parang gusto niya ng buong kapong itigil namin yun. Tapos sabi ko, Lord, bakit mo kinuha to? Ba't mo siya kinuha sa akin? Eh, siya na nga lang sandalan ko. Tapos naisip ko dun mag-suicide kasi parang wala na akong matatakbuhan kasi hindi ko din makausap yung mga parents ko. That day na yun, nakita ko yung Bible. Pagbukas ko sa First John, nabasa ko yung love sa atin ni God. Binigay niya si Jesus Christ sa atin para isave tayo. Tapos ako ang kapal ng mukha ako na mag-a-attempt ako ng suicide ng dahil lang dun sa reason na nasaktan ka, na iniwan ka. Pero hindi ko naisip na si Jesus Christ nagmatay para sa akin, para pagbayaran niya kasalanan ko. Uh, Na-invite po ako sa Elevate and dun ko po truly na first encounter si God. Ang focus ko lang nun is talagang yung program may isagawa lang sa school namin. Dumating din sa punto na Nagkaroon ako ng malaking problema. So, at that time, naghahanap ako ng makakausap. Time na yun, meron kaming pagtitipan, rescue, kabataan, elevate sa school. Hindi ko akalain na ano. Ako din pala is mare-rescue ng rescue kabataan. Hindi na po ako yung totally nagdate na galitin sa tao. Na-avoid ko na rin po yung panunod ng pornography. Uh, in terms of my sexuality naman po, truly, ang Panginoon, na uh, once mayroon po siyang gustong i- make yung path na straight at gagawin gagawin niya po yun napabalik niya po ako nakita ko po yung pagbabago sa sarili ko yung um, hindi na ako nagmumura takot na ako gumawa ng mga kasalanan naisip ko sa sarili ko na pag mahal mo yung isang tao hindi ka, ayaw mong gumawa na ikakasakit ka bakit ko gagawin to kung masasaktan ko si God uh, alam ko nararamdaman ng mga CCF team na meron ako pinagdadaanan kaya ang sabi niya sa akin eh, ma'am Baka gusto mong umaten sa amin. Namit ko yung kadi group ko, si Sistrina, na introduce niya sa akin si Lord. Dito po sa Elevate, I can really see na they have the passion to serve, they have the passion to share the gospel. And dun po mas na-encourage ako na God is always with me. I'm walking with, beside with God and dapat hindi ako matakot in sharing the gospel. Right now po, I'm discipling 15 students. Marami po akong nakitang pagbabago sa kanila in terms of their uh, quiet time with the Lord. Nakikita ko po na talagang truly nag-change sila. Yung heart ko is na gobern na mag-share ng gospel kasi maraming kabataan ang nangangailangan nito. Kasi isipin mo na ikaw na dati na gano'n, na hindi, hindi nakakakilala or walang relasyon, relasyon sa Diyos, is parang naliligaw yung landas mo. Doon ko na-realize na kailangan nila ng Diyos sa buhay nila. Na, nandun ako sa CCF, nakakita na ako ng family. Nung nagpunta ako doon, nung nakausap ko si Sistrina, sabi ko, ito ba yung answer na hinahanap ko? Hanggang sa, ayun, natuto na ako tuloy mag-quiet mag time. Natuto na rin akong magbuklat ng Bible. Unti-unti ko nang nararamdaman yung presensya ni Lord. Ang focus ko lang kasi noon is magturo, papasok. Sa pamamagitan ng rescue kabataan, nakita ko na ang dami palang pinagdadaanan ng aming mga sudyante. At naghahanap lang sila ng mga tao na po pwedeng sabihan, mga tao na po pwedeng makausap, na, na mga tao na po pwedeng mag-care sa kanila. As I disciple my families, my friends, my classmates in victories and also in trials, I know po na tapat si Jesus and kasama ko siya. Kasama mo si Lord, huwag kang matakot ishare yung naranasan mo ng pagmamahal niya. Kasama mo siya, ishare mo siya sa, sa mga kabataan na nangangailangan din ng tulong. My friends, Every single child that we rescue, we light, we make them into the light so that the people around them will have a glimpse of who Jesus is. And as they begin to see a glimpse of who Jesus is in the brokenness of each and every one of us, they will have a desire to love Jesus. All we need to do 
is to take the initiative. Be light in this dark world. Be salt in this tasteless world. You have the power. God has given His Spirit to us. We have the power and we can be witnesses. You and I have been called to be salt and light, not only in our generation, but in the next generation. So my challenge to you this, morning, this, morning, this afternoon is this. Would you take the challenge to be salt and light and to, to impact the next generation? Thank you so much and God bless you all. I'd like to call on, pa on Dr. Peter Tanchi to give us a challenge. As we close, can I ask you a question? After you have heard everything, why are we doing what we are doing? Think about it. Why are we doing what we are doing? If you don't know the why, you will not do it. Based on what Pastor Ricky has shared, net, and the message last Sunday, let me just give you a quick review. The reason why we do what we do, according to Jesus, according to our master, let's summarize this. Why do we do what we do? According to Jesus, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Uh, remember, according to Jesus, grammatically, what Jesus is saying, you and you alone are the salt of the earth. Let me repeat. Grammatically, what Jesus is saying, you and you alone. The emphasis is on the first word, you. So if the world is rotting, if a meat is decaying, if a fish is spoiling, you don't blame the meat, you don't blame the fish. You ask, where is the salt? If the place is dark, you don't curse the darkness. You ask, where is the light? If this country is going down, don't blame this country, don't blame politicians. You ask yourself, where is the salt, where is the light? And my answer is what? You and you alone are the salt and light of the world. And then Jesus expanded this before he went to heaven. Look at his last message. Ricky shared this. Everybody read. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In other words, no excuses. What Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you power. Now, the problem with us, when you think of power, you think of the Red Sea opening, you think of people um, coming back to life from the dead. Nothing wrong with that. We think of supernatural healing. But listen, what about the power, the miraculous power to change the heart of people? Like net. Like my own heart. Like your own heart. Do you believe we need supernatural power to change the hearts of people? You can change people's heart, but Jesus can. So Jesus is saying you will receive what? Power, my friend. Power. To change people requires supernatural power, which comes from God. You will be my witnesses. Notice what Jesus said. You are not going to be my lawyer. You are going to be my witness. I praise God for what Ricky said. Do you know what are the requirements for witnesses? Number one, personal knowledge. You cannot be a witness if you don't have personal knowledge. You cannot be a witness for Jesus if you don't have personal encounter with Jesus. Now, some of you are here. Perhaps the reason why you are not witnessing is what you have is religion. You are not to witness for religion. You are to witness for Jesus. Another important criteria to be a witness, credibility. You have to be credible. And that's why Jesus said, salt and light. If your life does not match your talk, your witness has no credibility. And number three, you must be willing and available. What Ricky said, you must be willing. Man, some of us are too busy. And that's why I'm passionate. Just like him, I'm passionate for the youth. We are pouring our resources. Do you know that the government has authorized us to go to all the high school in the whole Philippines? Are you aware of that? Praise God. And we were just thinking, if there are around 16 to 17 campuses, and we will deploy one worker each campuses, and you will minimum salary for young people, let's say 15,000. You know how much we need? Just compute. 15,000. One worker. Times 10,000. Friends, it's a lot of money. But why are we taking the challenge? 
I believe it is God who is going to be working in and through CCF, in and through the entire Christian body. We have challenged all churches in the whole Philippines to work together. Is God amazing? And, my friend, this is so crucial. Why are we going to be His witnesses? Can I just share with you the context? This is so crucial. You know why it is so crucial? If you read the previous verses, Jesus is saying, everybody, let's close with this understanding. To this he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. This is so crucial because Jesus died and rose again. And that event is so important because Jesus is saying, this is crucial, this is life-changing. Look, many convincing proof appearing to them over a period of 40 days. The reason why people don't know Jesus, they don't worship Jesus, they think he's just another man. My friend, Jesus died and rose again. And what was he talking about? One topic. Amazing. One important topic. For 40 days, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is real, my friend. And that's why it is crucial. I take this seriously because the kingdom of God is real. One day, he's going to take over the entire world. Are you ready? And you know, the disciples were asking, when will this be? Imagine, they were discussing, Lord, is it that this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? Because the kingdom of Israel is part of the kingdom of God that's going to be manifested. And you know what Jesus said? Don't waste your time. It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Lord has fixed by his own authority. Don't worry about when he's coming. What you should be concerned about is this. Everybody, together, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses. May I now request all of the people involved in uh, Elevate, in the Hub, please come up here. Everybody, please read together with me. We are not called to save the world. We are called to make a difference. We can do everything, but we can do something. And what we can do, we ought to do. That's, what, that's what's being sought and life is all about. I'm going to ask all the Hub pastors. These are the senior regional pastors. Remember, right now we're around 70 satellites. Next Sunday, you will hear what God is doing in and through CCF all over the world. We are going to discuss our foreign activities. And this will shock you. How in the world is CCF now all over the world? From the Middle East to Australia to North America to Europe. And then next, next Sunday, our anniversary. I want to give a simple message on our anniversary. I want you to begin praying now who you will bring. It is always life-changing during anniversary services. Amen? Many of you came to know the Lord during the anniversary service because somebody cared for you. Now, Pastor Eddie is in charge of the northern Luzon area. If God wants you to serve up there, who will you contact? This man. Now, this handsome man, Albert Rodriguez, he is in the Metro West. Metro East, the land of the rising sun. <laughs> Daniel Kiko and Senor Vicky Sumbing in charge of the Metro Manila area. And of course, the former General Bato, but now he's much better. He is uh, Ned Guchico and uh, International Church Planting. Is God good? Yes. Now, these are the key men, and I thank God for them. We have known each other, you won't believe this, years, years and years. I praise God for people who are involved in campuses and Elevate. Now, what's your assignment? I want us to pray for them today, okay with you? And then I want you to ask yourself, how can I be involved, especially in the youth ministry? In the Philippines, 52% of the entire population is below 25, 52%. The average age in the Philippines, the average age is 25, 23. The average age. Average age, like some of us. 23. And shockingly, 90% of people who come to Christ all over the world 
90% of people who come to Christ are before they reach the age of 20. So friends, I'm burdened for young people. They need you. But to me, it's a privilege. According to Jesus, you will be my witness. It's a privilege, folks. So you go down, visit the booth. We are asking for people to commit one half day a week, if you can. One half day, minimum. Transportation going to its campuses. We will train you. If you cannot go, you volunteer. Finance. Maybe two or three D groups. Finance one worker. We need thousands of them. Hundreds of millions. But you know what? God is going to do it. CCF has never run short of money if we do it God's way. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand up and pray for these people. Father God in heaven, I thank you. We thank you for our hub leaders, our regional pastors. We thank you that you have touched their lives. And more than that, you have allowed them to give their entire time, energy to the ministry. And we thank you for our youth leaders, youth workers, and Lord, plus the hundreds of campus missionaries. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these young people, young men, who have responded to the call. I now pray that you'll be the one to speak to everybody here, that we will not live a Christian life for ourselves, that we will know your purpose. You have called us to be salt and light. You have commanded us to be witnesses, and you have given us no excuses because of the Holy Spirit that's in and through us. So, Father God, it is now our collective prayers that you will use CCF and all of its hubs, all of its satellites, and all the Christian communities in this country, regardless of their denomination, that all of us will work together to help the young people come to know you and be transformed, and this country will never be the same, Lord. I pray for the Philippines. I pray that the Philippines will truly become a Christian nation, not just in title, but in realities. Give us the opportunities that you have given us already and the manpower to do the work and the resources. And we now pray for the president and his cabinet members. Thank you for his willingness to make us partners in social transformation. We now commit to you the entire day, especially to those that you have spoken to, that they will not say no to you, but they will be responding. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody.